Good afternoon, listeners. This is your host, David Wright, Disruptive Innovators Podcast. I am joined this afternoon by Mona Flores from NVIDIA. Mona, how are you? Great. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on. Um, Mona, can you start us off by telling me a little bit about your current role and where you are now? Yes, of course. Thank you, by the way, for having me on the show. Very excited to be here. Uh, so today I am the global head of medical AI at NVIDIA. Uh, I work at the intersection of our technology stack and translational medicine. Very great. Um, and we like to start our episode with a piece of actionable advice. Uh, as a, a leader of a you know great medical AI company, what's one piece of actionable advice you'll look to give our listeners today? Uh, actionable advice. So... If I have to, there's, there's many things, and I, I don't know that uh, everyone wants to follow my advice, but, but if I have to give one, it would be that not to be afraid to try new things. You, you never know what you will discover when you go and try new things. Uh, me personally, I'm, I'm a bungee jumper, figuratively and literally. So this is not my saying, but it's a favorite of mine, and it is jump and the net will appear. So again, go out there, try new things, try things you've never done before, you were afraid to try, and I think you'll be okay. I love that. So let's start by getting into your personal backstory. So we can go as, as far back as you'd like, but how did you start out and, and how did you get to, to where you are right now? Yeah, it's it's uh interesting uh it, it's interesting but at the same time it's not unique uh like many others who went into medicine first uh, i grew up wanting to help others and and again this is a cliche but it is true for most of us who go into medicine so i gravitated towards medicine because of that uh, but what i think is really interesting is that this theme of helping others if you look through my career and my life it took different shapes but it remains at the core of what I do. I grew up in a war. Uh, I saw surgeons then as heroes. They were the ones that took bullets out of uh, bodies. They were the ones who stitched wounds. They really were the ones who saved lives. And I, I so desperately wanted to be one. And that pull that I had in my formative years uh, living through that war yanked me back to medicine years later after I thought I had given up that dream. So I went back to, back to school. Uh, I studied to become a surgeon, a heart surgeon, mind you, instead of a trauma surgeon like I wanted to be when I was little. Uh, certainly with a different skill set, but still dealing with life and death. Fast forward more than 30 years later, and the theme has not changed. So today I remain as committed to saving lives in a different way. Um, I with a different skill set, if you may. I traded my scalpel today for a digital one. And instead of taking patients and helping them one at a time, I'm hoping to help millions of patients instead. Um, so I'm, I'm a firm believer that AI and advanced computing will help save more patients in the end because it's going to give us new abilities, new medicines, new treatments, things we could only dream of before. It's going to give us superpowers and that will help more patients. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so what's one of the most important things that you've learned in, in your life uh, over the course of your career? And what was life like before learning it and, and after learning it? Uh, I, I would think that the most important thing I learned is you can't always plan for things. Uh, you, you can have the best laid out plans and then something outside of your control can disrupt them and will disrupt them. So you need to take stock of where you are. Uh, look around you, see what do you have, what is the goal, and be ready to change course when things don't go as planned. Work with what you have while you strive to get what you don't have, whether it's a body of knowledge that you need to acquire, a new skill, uh, or even an object. Uh, in, in other words, you know, and again, this is not my saying, but you need to make lemonade from lemons. Before learning this, I was very idealistic, and I tried to bend the world to my will. Uh, today, I'm, I would say, more pragmatic. 
Uh, again, some things are under your control and others are not, but this is a lesson that I keep having to work at. And I keep having to learn and relearn because sometimes I still catch myself trying to sculpt the world as I think it should be. And I think pragmatism is uh, more important than idealism in some cases. Yeah. I, I live by the quote, acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. <laughs> to, um, to a certain extent, you know, you, you don't want to be complacent, but, but it's, it's true. Of course. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so I'm excited to to get into your your current role and your current organization, uh, partly because I and some of my listeners know this. I grew up building computers and uh, Nvidia, you know, graphics cards were present in in every machine I ever built. Um, so tell me a little bit more about. So you've been at Nvidia how how long now? Uh, almost four years. Almost four years. So let's talk a little bit about your your vision for the organization. Yeah, and and you know, again, this is I'm I'm part of a team, so this is this is the vision for for the whole team and the whole organization. Uh, uh, our, our mission at NVIDIA really is to deliver computing to accelerate medical research and to build innovative, you know, to accelerate medical research that will allow the building of innovative medical devices and products. Uh, it, it's to use all of the advancements in compute that we have today, all the advancements in software, and to harness artificial intelligence to make healthcare more accessible, to improve patient outcomes, to reduce costs. So we combine the world's most advanced computing hardware. You know, as you said, you know, we started with chips. Now we have a whole computing stack, and we combine that with with uh, application specific software platforms to accelerate all things healthcare, from genome sequencing to drug discovery to medical imaging to healthcare analytics. So, so I guess if I, if I have to specify one goal that we have uh, within the healthcare uh, vertical, and it is to democratize the ability to do AI in healthcare and make sure that it is accessible to everyone, and more importantly, to make sure that it is helping us build a better world and that goes for all verticals, not just healthcare. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Um, that you guys are the tip of the spear when it comes to 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 leading that charge to help our communities. Uh, what are some of the the key initiatives that you're focused on in 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 propelling that forward? There's there's many different initiatives that the company is working on. Me personally, uh, it, today I have three things that I'm concentrating on um, the, the first one that comes to mind and uh, top of mind is federated learning. Uh, we started in federated learning in 2018. Our uh, amazing engineers built this SDK and then we uh, took it to, to try it out in the wild and, and see how that works. And we learned from that and we uh, retweaked and, and we brought new features. and. All of that culminated in one of our biggest efforts in federated learning in 2019. So this is now um, January, February of 2019. You know, COVID has just hit the world hard. Everyone wanted to help. We at NVIDIA were the same. We wanted to help. So we worked, we were collaborating, had a uh, very strong collaboration with Mass General Brigham. And they had developed a model, an AI model, that is able to measure oxygen need in patients. So we worked with it, but they wanted this model to be better, and they wanted it to to work on on more patients than just the patients in Boston. So we worked with them and collaborated with with them and brought in uh, 19 other hospitals all over the world. This was like in four continents, eight countries, we brought all of this big consortium of hospitals together to take this model and use federated learning to improve this model. The goal of the model was to uh, measure uh, patients coming into the hospital or to the emergency department that are complaining of symptoms of COVID. And even if they did not have a confirmed COVID test, but they were, let's say, coughing, they had a fever, the model would be able to predict, is this patient going to need oxygen? And how much oxygen are they going to need? And are they going to need it in 24 hours? Are they going to need it in 48 hours? You can imagine in a 
so, uh, resource constrained environment like we had uh, in COVID, this model is pretty key in figuring out how do you allocate, you know, beds in the ICU? How do you staff your emergency room? How do you staff your ward? So what what we showed with federated learning, and by the way, just for, for the people, you know, of your viewers who do not, do not know what federated learning is, it is a way of training AI models without having to access the data, without seeing the data. Meaning if, if we have five different hospitals, or like in this case, 20 different hospitals, they all can keep their data where it is. We don't have to break any privacy rules. We don't have to have any specific agreements to be able to see the data. And they, we just ship the model to them. They train on their data, and then they give us just the learnings, the knowledge of their training. And then we aggregate all of that knowledge to, co to, to come to a federated learning model that actually we showed again in that COVID study, which we had called EXAM for uh, EMR XA uh, AI model, uh, because it took that input to it was chest X-rays and, and data from the EMR. We we showed that this federated learning model works better than any of the local models. So if I was one hospital and I had my data and I trained that model, this federated learning mo model worked better than what I could have done by myself. And not only that, it was also more generalizable so you, you, than any of the other models. So it didn't just depend on one certain population in one certain country. It worked uh, it, it had more generalizability than any uh, any model that is specifically trained for for one population. So that was that was a big thing we did in federated learning. We actually published this in Nature Medicine, and we continue to uh, expand federated learning today. We're expanding it beyond healthcare. We are expanding it in terms of features. We are expanding it in terms of uh, companies that we work with that are taking our federated learning uh, kernel, if you may, our, our SDK, and building products around it. So that's that's one of the focuses <laughs> that I have. Uh, the other thing that I'm focusing on is is everything natural language processing as it relates to healthcare. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've watched our recent uh, GTC last week. We announced uh, a uh, we announced a language model uh, called Singatertron. Uh, Singatertron is the only language model of its kind that is trained on uh, de-identified data, clinical data from the from the EMR and from from patient note from uh, hospital. I mean, sorry, <laughs> doctor's notes, and it's able to actually generate synthetic data. So this is work that we started uh, two years ago with the University of Florida. By the way, the University of Florida has the biggest supercomputer at, uh, at an academic institution. They have a cluster of 140 DGXA 100s, which is basically a humongous supercomputer. Huge. Uh, huge, exactly. And so with their experts and our experts, we collaborated first, actually we trained a bird style transformer model for clinical language. That was the biggest uh, clinical language model to date. Uh, and it actually, when we tested it and benchmarked it on uh, downstream tasks, it, it was state of the art. It actually performed better than any other model out there for those specific medical tasks. So this model we had called Gatertron, and, and, and I don't know if you get it, but you know it's the Gators, University mm -hmm. of Florida. They they patented Gatorade in the beginning. So this was Gatertron for a transformer model, you know, working at the University of Florida. Since that, we. You know, we actually just released, by the way, that model. It is on our, our NGC today, and if you want to access it and use it, you can do that freely. Uh, but from that work, we we went ahead and then we trained this new model, Singatertron for synthetic Gatertron, synthetically uh, for for a model that can generate synthetic data. So that's you know one of the highlights of of uh, some of the NLP stuff that we're doing. And the last thing that I'm, I'm focusing on is is working on digital twins, uh, whether it's for humans or cellular biology. This is very exciting work, but it's uh, also very early work, and we're, we're hoping uh, to get some uh, uh, some real wins there. Wow, that impressive work. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about some, maybe some of the challenges you're facing and that sort of thing, but. I'm just curious now thinking, I mean, uh, 
cardiothoracic surgeon to artificial intelligence how how did you how did you make that transition what what uh, prompted you to go into you know computer science and, and artificial intelligence and that kind of thing? Well, I, I think it's the promise of changing medicine. Uh, you know, as, as a CT surgeon, I saw a lot of things that were right in medicine, but I also saw a lot of things that were so medieval, if you may. Uh, I, I, I saw the potential of AI being able to, to move us towards a science, to move us towards precision medicine, to move us towards we are not guessing and we are not practicing as, as, as we are treating patients to where we can, we have a plan of action before we even go into the operating room, mm -hmm. uh, where, where we have our measurements and we have exactly mm -hmm. what we're going to need already laid mm -hmm. out because we practice outside of the operating room, uh, be, because we, we know how a certain stitch is going to affect the certain, you know, uh, the certain flow across a valve or what have you. So a, a lot, a lot of that is, you know, we, we're striving towards that today and we're striving towards it with new AI models and, mm -hmm. and simulation and, and fast computation. And I, I saw that as a chance to really, you know, as I said earlier, as, as a CT surgeon, I helped patients, a patient at a time, and, and that was amazing. But imagine scaling that and being able to actually create products that can help people everywhere people that you know maybe today don't even have access to cardiac surgery but because of the technology that we're building and that we're allowing people to build these medical applications that can just reach you know the far reaches of the world i yeah i, I identify with that so much i mean when we went through our our the reframing of our organization you know a, a little over a year ago back that that's really when we realigned our mission, it was really to, to do that, to how do we use technology to help more people, help help our communities, um, and and with a, a heavy emphasis on, on healthcare organizations. Um, so uh, pivoting back, um, you know, you, you guys are on this uh, noble mission. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing right now as you guys are along this path? I, I think the biggest challenge as as for everybody in, the, in this day and age is how fast things are going. You know, you, you go to sleep and you wake up and there's a new company and there's a new technology and there's a new way of doing things. So I, I, I think, and, and personally for me, it's like the biggest challenge is there's just not enough hours in the day. There's just so many exciting <laughs> opportunities, so many great things someone can pursue and do. And, and how do you choose? Like it's, it's, a, it's a sensory overload of everything that you're seeing, everything that's coming at you and, and then having to ha having to prioritize, you know, what is it that, that you uh, that you want and you should work on amidst this this sea of information that's coming at you. Um, and, and the other thing that, you know, the other challenge, and I think this is something, and, and I, I don't know, David, if, if, you know, I think you, uh, you are working from home sometime, uh, but this is something that we are probably all facing today, uh, especially the folks that are having to work from home. And it is, finding the boundary between work life and between personal life. I, I think these boundaries have been blurred and, and it takes a lot of discipline to be able to separate them and, and, and to keep true to what you want to do in both of these fields. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, stay, staying on the issue uh, of challenges, you know, uh, as I've been talking to leaders, we've, we've liked to ask about um, the biggest challenge or the biggest failure you've had to overcome over the course of your career and and what you learned from it. I think a, uh, our listeners get a lot of value from from those stories. Do you have uh, an example that, that you might be able to cite for us today? You know, I, I'm not sure that I would categorize, categorize them as failures. Uh, I, I prefer to call them mistakes. Yeah. All of us make mistakes, and I certainly have made many, and and I have made my share, and and I'm sure I'm going you know, to make a lot in the future. But I, I don't view them as failures. I, I view them as opportunities to learn and to grow. 
you know, a fear of making mistakes causes paralysis, in my opinion, because if you, if you do anything at all, you will at some point make a mistake. In other words, if, if you are not making mistakes, you're not pushing your limits, you're not trying, you're not trying hard enough. So it's better to get out of your comfort zone, stretch your abilities, make these mistakes, errors, failure, if you want to call them that, make them faster so that you can see them for what they are. And, and of course, this way you can correct earlier. So one thing that is crucial in my opinion is the ability to say, yes, I'm wrong, I was wrong, acknowledge the mistake, be kind to yourself, dust your pen, and then get up and try again. So there, there's no guarantee that you will not make more mistakes if you do that, but hopefully you will not make the same mistake twice. Yeah, no, that's that's great insight. I, I was listening to a a podcast earlier today about how, you know, true innovation requires vulnerability and requires making mistakes. And like you're saying, learning from it, integrating feedback, and then pressing forward, having the courage to just, you know, not dwell in, in it and, and, and learn from it, like you yeah, said. And I love that word that you said, you know, vulnerability. It, I, I think it's very important for us to be honest with ourselves and and to be vulnerable and, and, and be okay admitting that we are not perfect. No one is perfect. But, but, but the ability to, to face the adversity or the mistake or the failure and learn from it and do something with that knowledge that you hopefully gain from that experience, I think is key. Yeah. Uh, and when I, you know, I'm very, uh, transparent with with my listeners. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a CEO of a, a fairly you know successful tech consulting company. Um, you know, I built all of our consulting modules uh, from scratch, scratch, based on f- frameworks and best practices that aren't you know overly original. But I, I built them from scratch nonetheless, and I I struggled with with fear and and the first time taking clients through these new processes. Luckily, they, they've all been successful today, but it was it was scary. And I would struggle with, you know, imposter syndrome and, and things that, you know, I feel like a lot of leaders don't don't talk about, but I think it's important to get it out there because, you know, every everybody struggles with those things. So um, I think I agree. Vulnerability is just uh, incredibly important and you know have having the emotions is is natural it's it's what we do with them afterwards exactly. that really counts absolutely so mona you you manage a team of, of folks what are some of the best practices you and your team follow yeah and and actually that touches upon the, the question that we we're just discussing about failures uh david because w- one of our practices is fast iteration so you 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 have a goal of creating this MVP. You don't dwell on making it perfect. It is an MVP after all. You you create it, you you build it, you show it to folks, you you, you have them try it, you get feedback, you go and improve it. So uh, and, and and you keep iterating like that until you get to, to the final uh, product that you want. So really the ability to to know when is good enough for, for us to be able to start testing and, and, and you know, iterating fast on, on that idea. So fail fast, you know, and, and you might put an MVP out there that like, in the end you find out this doesn't make sense and we have to have a 180 degree shift in direction, but that's okay. You know, you, you didn't waste right. too much time because you failed fast. And so you redirect and you start again. And the other thing that I, I want to test out is, you know, NVIDIA is growing and, and we have today more than 20,000 employees, and, and these are really smart people that have been hired to, to really advance AI, and advance computing, and create amazing chips and software. And, and, and invariably, there will be someone that's working on something similar to what you want to do. So try not to work, you know, and, and this is something I, I personally try to do, is let's not reinvent the wheel in every different aspect of the company. Let us leverage what we have horizontally. Let us leverage the the talent that we have horizontally and what they help build in order to grow up, you know, go up the stack in, in a specific vertical. So being able to, to to know what's going on 
who's working on what and and what can you leverage from from their work and and bring them to the fold the, the work and and perhaps the team players so that you're not reinventing the wheel i think is important otherwise there's a lot of duplication and wasted effort and inefficiencies and and the last thing and this is something uh our VP of healthcare, Kimberly Powell, who leads all of our healthcare uh, vertical, uh, has instituted, and it's called Focus Fridays. You know, I know many companies have Focus Fridays, but this is something that we started doing uh, maybe a year ago, and I, and I think it's really important because it gives it gives our employees the um, the permission to sit back. And, and and not be in you know in meetings all day, not not be doing all the time, but be able to sit back and reflect and think about what do I need to do? What is the big picture? You know, try to get out of the weeds and, and, and see the forest for the trees. And and having the time, sanctioned time to be able to do that where you know meetings are discouraged so that you can actually do this work, I think is very important. And we, you know, we're not perfect at it, but we, we try to we try to uh, respect it as much as we can. Yeah, I love that. That mindfulness is an incredibly uh, important part of my life, personally, professionally, and otherwise. And and at Disruptive, we're we're also big proponents um, of of that. We don't we don't have a name for it, but um, you know we have, we have time carved out as well. Um, so. I, I like you. You Great said it actually. You just said mindfulness, and I, I think that's exactly what it is: giving people permission to be in the present, to be mindful. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty. I mean, you mentioned like the doing. I'm, I'm, I'm so guilty of that. Just getting in that that cycle of just getting getting things done. It, you know, people wear it as a badge of honor, and I and I get it. I'm I'm guilty of that as well. But. Um, you know, in order to to do the types of things that you guys are doing as an organization with that kind of uh, global macro vision, I mean, uh, taking steps like that, it just it makes sense. It, um, very cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the future of healthcare. So you guys are are obviously making great strides. Where do you see the, and this is a, a bit of a philosophical question, um, but where do you see the healthcare industry going and what do you think will be some of the biggest changes as time passes? Yeah, and and, and this is a very interesting question because I, I, I think, you know, we always talk about healthcare and healthcare industry, but I think in different regions of the world, in different systems of healthcare, the answer might be different. Um, and and how, how fast we get there, and how we get we get there, and what are actually the overall goals might be a little bit different. But one one arching theme would be you know taking care of patients, right, and making patients better. And if if I take that lens, um, I I see healthcare, and again I am taking it this as like in, in general everywhere. Uh, I, I see us in a steady march towards precision medicine where every patient is treated for the specific genetic and the specific proteomic makeup, uh, not as a peg in in this big population scheme. Uh, They are treated as individuals and not as, you know, again, a generic person. Uh, That's one. Uh, and I and I think that's really the holy grail of of AI in medicine that will hopefully one day get us there. Uh, There's also drug discovery. Today, it's it's really expensive to come up with new drugs. It takes 10 to 12 years. Uh, it takes billions of dollars. Uh, I, I really think that uh, AI and fast computation and simulation will allow us to do this faster and cheaper. So I see more drugs coming out for all kinds of diseases, for diseases that we have deemed perhaps undruggable in the past to this date to ones that were too rare for pharma to want to invest in because there's only a few patients that have that disease. Is it is it worth billions of dollars and all of this time? Yes, it is worth it. And hopefully we can make it cheaper and faster so that everyone will work on, on, on the diseases that only affect a few of our uh, loved ones. And then I see us preempting disease before it sets in. Today, medicine is very much a reactionary sport. It's like you go to the doctor because something is wrong. We treat you because we see something on your CT scan. 
you know, because you're complaining of tummy pain or, or, or what have you. We, we need to steer patients towards health before, before disease sets in, before it, it is too late to intervene, whether it's early diagnostics or, or prevention and, and being able to predict that if you stay on this course, this is what's going to happen. Can we fix it beforehand? You know, if a car is going on a road and you know there's the pothole in front of you, you steer the car and you go any, you know, to, to the side. Can we do that in medicine? Can we anticipate where these potholes are, how soon we're going to be encountering them and do something actionable to actually uh, prevent us getting into that pothole? So I see us solving chronic diseases also, like, like things that we live with every day and, and we hear in the news all the time, you know, there's so many, uh, there's an epidemic of obesity, of diabetes, of heart disease, you know, I, I, I see I see AI and, and again AI in very general terms being able to solve these chronic diseases um, by by a combination of everything else I mentioned by a combination of being able to preempt the disease, uh, prevent it, predict when it's going to happen, and by making available personalized treatments, whether it's personalized radiotherapy, you know that that is more precise than what we have today, whether it is personalized. Um, you know, even gene editing, whether it's personalized uh, drugs that we are able to, again, manufacture and, and, and come up with and discover faster. Uh, so I, I think the future is bright if we continue on, on this journey, and, and I hope to see it sooner than later. Yeah, we, we even today say that it's it's crucial for, for providers and payers, for that matter, to, to make healthcare services uh, highly personalized and, and radically convenient, but that takes it to a whole nother level. And I, I, lo I love that. Um, so before we move on to the last couple questions I have for you, I, I wanted to circle back. I mean, you mentioned the the drug companies and, and their, their research. Are there applications there to leverage your federated learning like the health systems are in order to parlay their, their data together to to come to those outcomes of, of new drugs that can, you know, help the public uh, quicker? And is, is there, are there barriers to that because of um, their, um, their prerogative to, to keep that secretive? Or what have you seen in, in that arena? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very astute question. Uh, and the answer is yes. Whatever you have an AI model that you benefit from training on a large, distributed, diverse data set, you can use federated learning. And certainly Pharma has taken note of this. And we have, uh, we have a couple of pharma companies that are currently doing projects using federated learning. We also have uh, Bayer actually, and this was last year, they, they took upon themselves to simulate uh, doing federated learning across uh, many sites uh, in, in medical imaging and, and showed, you know, basically proved to themselves that yes, this is, this is feasible, this makes sense. And, and they're trying to integrate that into their imaging platform. Uh, there has been, there's a, a consortium called Melody and that was in the UK and that was between many different pharma companies. And they were also using it uh, in order to inform some of the lower mm -hmm. level steps that you need uh, where they are AI informed steps that you need before you can go and discover a drug. So every, you know, and you mentioned mm -hmm. that is this how are they going to collaborate together? Everyone has their own secret sauce, their own IP. And, and the beauty of this federated learning is they can, they can actually learn from each other's data without actually opening the kimono and showing everyone what are the molecules that I have in my own library so that everyone can benefit and you can up-level that drug discovery platform. Um, there, there are other pharma companies that are trying to do uh, federated learning for AI models that learn from different modalities, not just imaging, you know, whether bringing in uh, genetic information in addition to phenotypic information, in addition to perhaps pathology uh, and imaging and unstructured data to be able to actually train an AI model. So 
across the whole stack of AI, you know, the, there's the basic layers of models that you need upon which then you start going more and more differentiated to where you get to your IP. There's many things underneath that you can work on in a federated learning way. And and even within one, you know, pharma company, if, if you think of the of the pharmaceutical companies, you know, anyone that you want to think of today, Pfizer, Novartis, Janssen, Roche, you know, all of them, they have many different sites and many different clinical sites that they work with. So can they leverage this information from all of these different sites without having to bring the data to one place? And remember, transferring data can be very expensive. This is forgetting all the privacy hurdles that you have from HIPAA to GDPR to what have you. So can they uh, right. can they do this while leaving the data in place and, and circumventing all of these hurdles, if you may? And and it's not lost on pharma. And and on on medical device companies, you know, people who are building scanners and, and building better algorithms for reconstructing images, they also have scanners in thousands of hospitals. Do they need to bring all of that data to one place in order to run an AI model on it? They can actually use federated learning today. And we, we have uh, put a lot of thinking in our federated learning uh, uh, SDK, we call it FLARE, F-L-A-R-E. And, and with FLARE, you know, we have differential privacy, we have homomorphic encryption. And again, last week, we just announced our, uh, announced mm -hmm. our Hopper architecture that allows you now not just to keep the data private, as we were doing, but also keeping the model private. So if you send your model to Hospital A to, to be able to train on that local data, the hospital doesn't even need to see what that model is. Uh, if you are, let's say, a device company that's trying to train your data across uh, many sites and you don't want anyone to, to get to your IP. So the answer is yes. <laughs> that's a, yeah, no, that's that's super cool. I mean, you mentioned globally with, with data sharing laws. I mean, it's just, that's a huge, huge deal. So um, thank you for that insight. Of course. So to, to close out, you know, we, we like to ask our, our guests, if you could go back in five or, or 10 years in time, what, what advice would you give your younger self? Chill. <laughs> I would say to my younger self, <laughs> just chill. And in fact, I would say it to my current <sighs> self too. You know, sometimes we get so caught <laughs> up in the race, we forget to reflect, we forget to, David, we forget to appreciate that we even made it to the race in the first place. So, you know, I, th I think that's really important to put things in perspective and to reflect and, and, and to just take things in stride. And, and the other thing is also, you know, eliminate the world impossible from your dictionary. Many things that you would have thought are impossible if you, with the right resources, with looking at them with the right perspective, almost anything is possible in this world. You just have to, to look at it differently and try to think outside of the box. I love that. Yeah, it's it's that combination of, of being a dreamer, but also being pragmatic and, and just getting after it. Um, Mona, thank you so much for being on today. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to share this with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks a lot.